Um, hi everyone, <clears throat> just a brief message. I will turn off my video because it is a bit, all, a bit unusual to <laughs> be in a train. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's better for the recording not to show me with the mask on and in the in the train cabin. So I'm here, <laughs> even if you don't see me. <laughs> Thanks okay. for being here. Yeah. I don't think anyone has a problem with seeing people in masks after the last 18 months. <laughs> if you don't want to show, that's fine, but I really wouldn't feel bad about it. Okay, so we are now live on YouTube. Yeah, we're live streaming right now. So um, I see nothing, Greg. You don't see anything. Okay. No. Uh, we, we are live though, right now. Um, I promise you. I can see the video live streaming now. Well, maybe, I, you refresh I, the, maybe you refresh the link. Um, and see if you see it uh, live. No, nothing. Well, I can keep track of the, um, there are seven watching now. It started streaming less than one minute ago. I can keep track of um, any comments or questions coming in during the, during the question and answer session since I can see it myself. If you wanna just go ahead and get started and- um, well, I certainly don't think we should hold things up much more. Yeah. Uh, I'm just puzzled as to why. Hmm. I mean, the, the link you sent me, uh, I opened that and I just get a, a bunch of other links to click, uh, none of which was, is ours. Hmm. Let me try this now. I'll send this to you, Graham, okay? And then you can... Um, uh, how are you sending it, by email? I'll send it to you by email, yeah. Let's see. Okay, it's sent to you. Go ahead and check it out, see if you can see it. All right, up this now, I'll send this to you, Brent. Okay, that's good. Okay. Excellent, all right. Um, thanks everybody for being here. Let's go ahead and jump in. Um, so let me just start by welcoming everybody to our colloquium series on Hegel and dialethism. I want to thank uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong and in particular, uh, the Archive for Phenomenology and Contemporary uh, Philosophy for uh, funding the uh, series. And in particular, uh, in helping us produce this flyer and the very nice advertisement that we were able to produce. Um, and I'd, I'd also like to thank uh, Graham and Elena for uh, co-organizing this uh, with me and agreeing to help out in the organization of the event. And of course, everybody who offered to give papers and offer your expertise and your insights um, to the conversation. Um, so let me just say a, a quick word about motivation and then um, kind of the organization. Uh, some of this you guys are well aware of. Um, I just want to say a brief word about, you know, why we started the colloquium series. Um, so recently, 2020, um, I published a book on Hegel uh, in which I offered a dialectic reading of Hegel's logic, among other things. And I, I kind of also recently stumbled upon Elena Fakara's book, The Form of Truth, which is also heavily engaged with Hegel's logic in which he advances and discusses a dialectic reading of Hegel as well. And I also noticed uh, recently Todd McGowan, who was, who was going to participate but has uh, dropped out due to schedule conflicts, published a book in summer of 2019 on uh, Hegel's contradictory revolution. The book is called Emancipation After Hegel, Achieving a Contradictory Revolution. And the book doesn't directly engage with uh, dialethism per se, but it revisits the problem of contradiction and considers uh, seriously the prospect that contradictions are preserved in the system. Um, so I had originally, I had this idea in mind um, to do a workshop, just a small workshop, kind of discussing these recent works that are kind of advocating or advancing um, the, these dialectic readings of Hegel taking them seriously. And I had approached Graham about the possibility of organizing a workshop on Hegel and dialethism um, to discuss some of the ideas, problems, and arguments in these uh, recent books. And uh, Graham agreed to host um, this workshop. And then we invited Elena to join the conversation to see if she'd be interested. 
And after a few conversations, we decided to extend the, the workshop to a whole lecture series or colloquium series, uh, one uh, with the hope that we would um, not only uh, have more speakers, but we'd also allow for a greater diversity of points of view. We would all be agreeing with each other. But there would be um, some uh, a richer discussion and debate of the positions. Um, and to also give us some time to think about some of the difficult issues that arise here. Um, uh, when we read Hegel, uh, it's a slow, long process. So uh, yeah, the series will uh, run all semester. And uh, today, of course, I'll give the first paper just to get us started. And generally we'll have an hour for the presentation. You know, uh, you can use less time if you want, you can use a little more. And then we'll have whatever's left for the discussion. So ideally there's an hour for the talk, an hour for the discussion, uh, but you know, the give and take depending on uh, how long your paper is. Um, at the end of the series, we'll have a little round table. We'll have a discussion together uh, about the topics that came up, any, any interesting arguments, themes, people wanna discuss, come back to. Um, okay, so that's about the motivation, organization, where we're going. Uh, so today's our first session. I thought it would be good if we would um, introduce ourselves briefly. A lot of people viewing know you all already, but uh, all of us haven't actually met each other in person. I know I haven't met all of you in person. I've met a few of you. Some of you I've only met virtually. Uh, so some of you I haven't even met virtually. So I'd like to, uh, maybe everyone could say their name, um, their position, affiliation, and then if you want to add anything about your interest in Hegel or dialethism, I, uh, you're welcome to, uh, to offer that as well. Um, so I'll, I'll start and then maybe Graham and Elena can introduce themselves, and then we, we can go through all the participants. Uh, so my name's uh, Gregory Moss. I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. It's 8.15 p.m. where I am, so I will be uh, engaging in this dialectical and speculative thinking well into the evening uh, with you all. Um, yeah, and my interest in Hegel stems from, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly interested in thinking about the absolute and, um, and my interest in Hegel and contradiction stems from my interest in, in absolute thinking, whatever that turns out to be. Um, so, uh, Graham, maybe you want to say a few words, introduce yourself. Okay, so I'm, I'm Graham Priest. Um, I work at the City University of New York, uh, the Graduate Center, where it's now 8.15 in the morning. So I've been up for since quite early this morning. Uh, I, I'm a bit of an outlier in this group because um, I'm not a Hegel scholar. Um, of course, I'm interested in dialethism, um, and I've been reading Hegel for a long time. Well, many, 40 or plus years ago, when I was working on dialethism, someone said to me, hey, this bloke Hegel, he sounds like a dialethist. Oh, really? So I started to read it because I couldn't understand a word of it. So I've been trying to make sense of it ever since. And, you know, I, I'm hoping that these sessions will shed some light on the situation. So that, that's it. Elena? Hi, my name is Elena Ficara. Um, I'm... Uh, teach at the University of Paderborn in Germany um, and I started um, studying philosophy uh, in Torino in Italy and then moved to Germany and was uh, and am uh, um, still today very much interested in uh, German classical philosophy especially uh, Kant and Hegel and um, I started actually as a Heidegger uh, scholar and uh, uh, my interest in uh, dialethism uh, um, is uh, very much motivated uh, through my uh, interest in the current relevance of uh, the transcendental and the dialectical tradition. And so I think that um, dialethism is uh, especially relevant from this perspective. And then recently at the University of Paderborn, I have uh, Started, started uh, working more in the history of logic and in the philosophy of logic. And so uh, dialectism uh, and the connection between Hegel's dialectics and dialectics, and especially 
relevant uh, um, for deepening the question, uh, what is the relevance of the German uh, classical uh, thinking about logic for logic uh, as it was historically con conceived and as it is uh, conceived now. Thanks, Elena. Uh, Stefan, maybe you could introduce yourself. You're muted, Stefan. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, my name is Stefan Schick. I'm currently a lecturer for philosophy at the University of Leipzig. Um, yeah, so I started working on Hegel and um, dialysis in my PhD thesis, which was 10 years ago. Um, so yes, it's nice to come back to an old topic. Um, so thank you for inviting me to the workshop. Welcome. Uh, Anthony? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony Bruno. I teach philosophy at Royal Holloway, University of London. Um, I work mainly these days on post-Kantian logic. I'm writing a, finishing a book now on uh, Fichte's role in Hegel's logical revolution and then Schelling's criticism of the same. Um, and uh, I might be one of the lone dissenting voices in uh, you know, what the connections are, if any, between dialectic and dialetheism. Um, but I'm looking forward to the discussion and happy to be here. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. Great to have you. Uh, Paul, can you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Paul Redding. Um, I'm um, now Emeritus Professor at um, University of Sydney in Australia. Um, I've been working on Hegel for far too long for any human being. Um, and I've got, I, over the last mm, couple of decades, I suppose, I got sucked into Hegel's logic, not from the direction of dialetheism, but First of all, um, engaging with uh, Bob Brandom's work um, and coming to sort of push against it in a certain sort of way. Um, and over the last number of years, my take on Hegel's logic has been trying to look at him in the history of um, a tradition called uh, Analysis Cetus, which is a Leibniz, Leibniz sort of originated tradition which took off in the 19th century. Um, and I think there's all sorts of interesting connections between Hegel and contemporary mathematicians um, around the time um, uh, that developed in areas like um, um, uh, what's it called uh, projective geometry and so on. Um, so I'm, I'm working on a sort of a long project at the moment on that. Uh, thanks a lot, welcome. It's great to have you here. Uh, Michelle, you could say something, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Michela Bordignon. I work at the Universidad Federal de ABC, uh, which is also called uh, UNILULA uh, because it was founded by uh, Luis Inacio Lula da Silva. And I'm very proud of this. And I've been studying Hegel for the last 20 years, <laughs> which is a lot. <laughs> I think so. I was thinking about what Paul Redding was saying, but I think it's really, uh, uh, and, and I cannot stop doing that because I still have a lot of problem. I've been studying contradiction in Hegel, in Hegel dialectic for a long time. I have a book on Hegel dialectism, which I never, never published. I don't know if I will ever publish it. Of course, uh, I'm looking forward to discuss with all of you uh, to see more problems, uh, more uh, ideas and uh, I'm really sure it would be an interesting series of seminars. And so thank you for uh, inviting uh, to join this group. Yeah, so really good to have you. We're looking forward to that book coming out. <laughs> no, no, okay. Uh, Alessandro, Alex, you could say a word. I don't know if, or maybe you can't because you're in the train. Um, maybe not. Maybe we'll skip Alex and go on to Franca. Franca? Uh, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, Alex, we can hear you now. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Greg. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I am Alessandro De Cesaris. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of uh, Torino, where uh, Elena studied. And uh, uh, I started out, uh, I, I got my degree 
with uh, a thesis on Aristotle and Hegel on the contradiction. And right now I'm writing a book on Hegel's notion of uh, singularity. So uh, that's how I met uh, Gregory and I really look forward to this discussion. Thank you for having me here. Great to have you, even on the train. Uh, Franca, uh, last but not least. Uh, you're muted. Sorry, could you unmute yourself? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so I'm very happy to discuss with you, and uh, I'm uh, glad to see you uh, in person. Not in person, but <laughs> in uh, in image. Uh, for instance, uh, Michaela, hi Michaela, Alessandro, um, Graham, uh, Gregory, and uh, Paul, and so uh, I'm very, very uh, pleased uh, to discuss with you because, uh, as uh, possibly, uh, because I study well, I, I currently teach uh, philosophy at the University of Milan. I am, um, I've studied uh, particularly uh, their relationships between analytic and continental philosophy and uh, a crucial concept of this relation is the concept of a uh, contradiction and uh, uh, I've been reading Hegel for many 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 years uh, since uh, my high school practically which means very many uh, years and um, uh, and uh, surely um, um, dialysis uh, is uh, the aspect uh, is uh, the current is uh, the uh, the theory in the analytical tradition which is uh, uh, in a sense uh, the best in her the best uh, uh, con uh, continuation the best uh, uh, which uh, in a sense uh, correspond to what Hegel wanted uh, by, from philosophy, and uh, and so yes, I am deeply interested in this connection, Hegel and dialysis. But uh, maybe I'm more interested in uh, the concept of truth, uh, paradoxes, uh, and contradiction. And so uh, this uh, will be my focus. I am. Um, I want to to ask uh, um, Hegel scholars uh, and uh, dialysis uh, what you can really say about uh, this concept, the, the, this, uh, the concept of truth and uh, uh, the inevitability of uh, contradictions uh, in a sense. Okay, that's all. I have already done my, my talk. <laughs> this is my talk. <laughs> Bye. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. Nice okay. to meet you. Yeah. And is that everybody? Everyone has introduced themselves, I think, who's here. And okay, uh, great. So it's almost 8.30. So today, I mean, I have a, I have a talk that I'm going to give on Hegel's absolute dialethism. That's the title. And uh, it runs about one hour. And so then um, if, you ever, if you want to take a break, just go get yourself a juice from the fridge or something or, or a beer. You might need it. Um, and then we'll have 30 minutes, uh, I guess, for questions and answers. Um, so yeah, uh, if it's okay, uh, Graham, should we go ahead yeah. and get started or? Yeah, look, uh, just so people know, I'm gonna moderate the discussion, okay? Um, if you wanna ask a question, I think the easiest thing to do is just to put your virtual hand up and it comes up on the participant board. So let me know if you wanna ask a question uh, and I will uh, cue you in um, at an appropriate point. Greg, do you want to take questions as you go along, or do you want people to hold them to the end? Uh, I would like it if uh, I just completed the paper and then we have a, the questions are raised. Okay. I'll take right. them one by one at that point. Okay. That's what I would prefer. Yeah. All right, fine. Then off you go. All right, thanks. Okay, so let me get started. All right. Hegel's absolute dialethism. Let me get my clock running so that I keep myself honest here. I don't let myself go on too long. Okay. Dialethism is the view that some contradictions are true 
Accordingly, in order to answer the question, is Hegel a dialethist? We need to establish that there are contradictions in Hegel's system, but not only this, but that they are true contradictions. In this paper, I will focus almost exclusively on whether there are true contradictions in Hegel's system of logic. So this paper is mostly a question of interpretation. First, Hegel's science of logic begins without presuppositions. Because the system begins without any presuppositions, Hegel certainly cannot endorse the principle of non-contradiction as a presupposition of the logic. As Hulgate notes, whether and in what way the principle of non-contradiction is true must be established in the course of the system of logic itself. Likewise, because the logic is without presupposition, we equally cannot presuppose that the principle of non-contradiction is false. Again, Hulgate is on point when he writes that, quote, if Hegel's logic does turn out to violate the law of non-contradiction, it will be because thought proves not to be completely governed by that law, close quote. So in short, if the principle of non-contradiction is false, the system of logic must establish its falsehood in the course of its development. Second, because contradiction is one of the categories of the logic, Hegel's logic contains contradictions. For this reason, there cannot be any serious dispute about whether there are contradictions in Hegel's system or whether they arise. This is clear too from some recent literature. Philosophers, some of whom who deny that Hegel is a dialethist, will also acknowledge that contradictions at least arise in the system. The dispute about dialectic readings of Hegel does not concern whether the principle of non-contradiction is a presupposition of logic, or I would say should not concern that, or whether contradictions are present in the system at all. Rather, the dispute should focus on whether those contradictions which do arise are in fact true or not, or true and false. We can formulate the question in Hegelian terms. Are the contradictions in the system only canceled or are they canceled and preserved? If one holds that the contradictions necessarily arise in the system of logic but are not true, the contradiction and indeed its truth must be canceled. Without question, it is the case that in the science of logic, the concept of contradiction is sublated and the result of that sublation is the concept of the ground. As Hegel makes clear as early as the Differenzschrift, the antinomy is, quote, der sich selbst aufhebende Widerspruch, close quote. However, what does sich selbst aufhebende Widerspruch mean? According to H.S. Harris, this means the contradiction cancels itself. However, if we remember the simple fact that aufheben can mean both to cancel and to preserve, sich selbst aufhebende Widerspruch can mean the contradiction that cancels and preserves itself. A number of recent commentators advance the view that Hegel's philosophy does in fact contain true contradiction. While it's well known that Graham Priest holds that dialectic is dialectic, Melania Fakara also offers a, dialet a dialethist vision of Hegel in her recent book, The Form of Truth. In her article, Contradiction or Non-Contradiction, Michaela Bordignon too reads Hegel as affirming the truth of contradiction. She writes, if we select some parts of Hegel's philosophy and get rid of the thesis of the truth of contradiction, like Brandom does, we are not looking at Hegel anymore because we are just looking somewhere else, close quote. In the German speaking literature, the luminous Heidelberger professor Jens Halfwassen seems also at points to endorse the view that Hegel affirms true contradiction. His book, Hegel und der Spät Antike Neuplatonismus, argues that Widerspruch ist darum gerade das Auszeichnende aller Vernunftkenntnis. And further, jedes spekulative Einsicht der Vernunft enthält darum für Hegel einen Verstoß gegen den Satz von Widerspruch. By my lights, Hegel's philosophy, not only its spirit, but also its letter, affirms the truth of contradiction. And more specifically, the truth of contradiction is aufgehoben in the sense that it is not only canceled, but also preserved. In order to uh, move against the objection that a dialectic reading of Hegel imposes foreign ideas onto Hegel's text, I will employ concepts endemic to the text uh, itself and try to show that a dialectic reading is motivated uh, by the spirit and letter of Hegel's thought itself. Part two, the absolute atemporality of Hegel's logic. While logic is a presuppositionless science, the philosophy of nature must presuppose logic. While time simply does not appear as a category of the science of logic, it does appear as a category in the philosophy of nature. According to Hegel, Quote, the truth of space is time and thus space becomes time, close quote. The category of space, however, is the first category of nature. For its part, the category of nature 
depends upon the completion of the science of logic. Thus, the category of time does not appear within logic itself. Rather, time is dependent upon logic. Logic only contains eternal truths. Hegel puts it more colorfully. Logic is, to quote Hegel, the exposition of God as he is in his eternal essence before the creation of nature and a finite spirit. In Hegel's philosophy, whatever logical truths there may be, these are eternal truths. Hegel easily avoids the charges of psychologism or even naturalism that always plague empiricism, since the categories of the logic are not derived from anything translogical. The categories of the logic are neither natural nor psychological entities, nor is their content derived from anything natural or psychological. In the place of God, if that makes people uncomfortable, one can substitute the term absolute. Quote, being itself and the special subcategories of it which follow, as well as those of logic in general, may be looked upon as definitions of the absolute, close quote. Why should we consider being and the categories of the logic in general to be absolute? Consider being, the category with which the science begins. The beginning is, but without further qualification. The predicate being does not draw any difference between anything. By saying X, but by, by saying of X that it is, or of Y that it is, one cannot differentiate X from Y. The virtue of beginning with being, the category that is completely devoid of determinate content, science of logic begins without presupposing any determinate content. Being is indeterminate. Merely relative predicates do not apply to everything. Instead, they apply to this or that being. A concept is absolute, at least on the condition that it is not relative, namely that it applies to everything. What is a relative determination maintains its independent reality by negating what it is not, thereby occupying a relative position vis-a-vis -vis what is other to it. It is this in contrast to that. However, since being is completely indeterminate, it is not even distinct from or relative to what is other to it, not even distinct from determinacy. To put it otherwise, the indeterminate is without limit and all encompassing. Accordingly, indeterminacy is absolute. Being is an absolute beginning. It does not exist relative to anything else. Just as being is absolute, so are all of its successor concepts, such as the concept of nothing. The virtue of having no determinate content whatever, being is nothing, that which is empty of determination. Likewise, because nothing is without determination, as we know, it's indistinguishable from being. One cannot look to nothing to find what is other to being, for it too is being. Because each immediately vanishes into the other, each is becoming. Being ceases to be being, nothing comes to be being. Each is immediately the other, each constitutes a unity of being and nothing. Being is the unity of being and nothing, and nothing is the unity of nothing and being. Since each is immediately the other, what does not vanish is the very unity of being and nothing. This is a stable unity of being and nothing, constitutive of determinate being, Dasein, that Hegel characterizes as quality. Being becomes qualified being, but it can only become qualified being through the self-overcoming of becoming. Becoming vanishes, for in every case, we always find the same unity that never ceases, the unity of being and nothing. Hegel proceeds to identify this stable, non-vanishing unity of being and nothing in the form of being as reality, while the stable unity of being and nothing on the side of nothing is negation. Note, of course, that in Hegel, negation is not identical to nothing, but is rather a further development out of nothing. In the logic of determinate being or Dasein, reality and negation become the moments of the categories of something and other. Reality is not negation and thereby admits negation. Negation has its own reality apart from reality itself and thereby admits reality. Something for Hegel is constituted as a unity of reality and negation in the form of reality, while the other is the unity of negation and reality on the side of negation. Hegel rehearses how the absolute transforms itself into determinate being out of its indeterminate indeterminacy, pure being as such. Okay, I'm not just gonna read the whole science of logic. <laughs> Let's do some commentary, okay. In short, Hegel's logic is a science of categories, all of which are non-temporal and absolute concepts. The absolute is being. However, in virtue of what being is, being is nothing. The very concept of being transforms into nothing by itself, autonomously. Auto cath auto, to use Plato's phrase in his description of forms, itself by itself. Hegel rehearses how the absolute transforms itself into determinate being out of indeterminacy. 
As a result, we quickly discover the concept of the absolute is self-determining. In the science of logic, every category is an instance of an atemporal self-transforming totality. Like all the others, contradiction is one of these non-temporal categories of the absolute. Because every concept of the science of logic is a concept of the absolute, and contradiction is a concept of the science of logic, so contradiction too is an absolute concept. Because contradiction is a concept that applies to everything, it is an absolute category. It is what Hegel calls, and these are his words, der absolute Widerspruch, the absolute contradiction. Given its absolute application, Hegel remarks that contradiction like identity, difference, and opposition can be formulated as an absolute principle. Quoting Hegel, all things are in themselves contradictory. If everything is contradictory, then the categories of the logic must be contradictory too, from being to the absolute idea. Hegel himself seems to declare as much. Quoting Hegel, on the contrary, every determination, anything concrete, every concept is essentially a unity of distinguished and distinguishable elements which, by virtue of the determinate essential difference, pass over into elements which are contradictory. If every concept is contradictory, then the sublation of contradiction in the science of logic should not just be cancellation, but it must also be preservation. The preservation of contradiction is also engendered by the atemporal character of logic. There are many contradictions that arise in the course of Hegel's logic, such as being is nothing, finitude is infinite. Are the contradictions being is nothing, infinitude is infinite canceled? Yes, for they are not sufficient for the full articulation of the absolute idea. None of these then stands ultimately by itself. Each is preserved as an element of the absolute. However, are the contradictions not also preserved? Given that the science of logic is atemporal, the developments do not happen in time. Being becomes nothing, infinitude becomes infinite, but it would be misguided to ask when being became nothing or when finitude will become infinite. Because it is the case, it is true at one place in the system that finitude is infinite and the logic itself is atemporal, it is always the case that finitude is infinitude. Simply put, because logic is atemporal, being is nothing, infinitude is infinite, are eternal truths. Given the atemporality of the logical system, the contradictions are preserved. In short, the contradictions are canceled, they're also preserved. That's another contradiction, they're aufgehoben. Because each contradiction is preserved, the absolute idea contains all the contradictions so that as Priest notes, the absolute would be, quote, the biggest contradiction of them all. Because Hegel preserves the absolute contradiction, I hold that Hegel is an absolute dialethist. This means one, the absolute is, two, it is a contradiction, and three, that it is a true contradiction. Because the absolute contradiction is an, is an eternal truth, Hegel's commitment to preserving the absolute contradiction in logic is nothing less than a commitment to the eternal truth of contradiction. Because philosophy thinks the categories, the categories are the intentional objects of the philosopher's logical knowing. Because the philosopher knows the categories in time, one might suppose that the logical categories themselves to be temporal. One might even attempt to refute the atemporality of logic by inserting time into the logical sequence of categories. First, this may not save logic from preserving contradiction, for time itself seems to be explicitly contradictory. For Hegel, time is, quote, that being which, inasmuch as it is, is not, and inasmuch as it is not, it is, close quote. But what is more, one must be careful not to equivocate on the logic as a system of categories and the logic as an object of philosophical knowing. Philosophers can know, philosophers can only know the logical categories because they are born and educated. While logic presupposes nothing, the activity of the philosopher supposes mind and nature and constitutes a final stage in the development of Hegel's system. It is true that being becomes nothing and that being is nothing. However, neither the development of this truth nor the truth itself depends on the philosopher articulating and stating that it is so. Being is nothing is the case and would be the case even if no philosopher ever thought it. Hegel is clear that the truth of the categories and their development does not depend upon our thinking. Rather, our thinking acquires its direction from them. Quoting Hegel, still less shall we say of the concepts of things that we dominate them or that the thought determinations of which they are the complex are at our service. On the contrary, our thought must accord with them. Philosophical logic thinks what is always already there. It must simply, as Hegel says, watch what is going on. 
By taking the atemporal as its object, logic itself becomes a science, a science of logic. Subsequently, this science can be communicated via speech and writing to members of the philosophical community. The advent of the science of logic is a historical event, but the historical event should not be confused with the non-temporal development of logical categories as such. Part three, from contradiction to ground. But does Hegel not make it clear that contradiction is sublated? He does indeed. Being, however, is also sublated. However, it doesn't occur to people usually to ask, is the absolute idea or is it a being? It goes without saying that the sublation of being engenders both that it is canceled and preserved. Each category is and it is a being. However, contradiction hardly receives the same charitable treatment. Why in the case of contradiction is it merely canceled and not also preserved as in the case of being? I hold to the contrary, just as being remains absolute, the category of contradiction remains absolute too. It's both canceled and preserved. The sublation of contradiction does not cancel it completely. Like being, it is preserved as a constituent of successor categories that follow it. This is already obvious from the text itself. Hegel explicitly identifies contradiction in a variety of categories long after its sublation. Hegel proclaims that syllogism too, quote, must run into contradiction. We even discover contradiction in the absolute idea itself. Quoting Hegel, it is rather the other in itself, the other of another. Hence, it includes its own other within itself and is consequently the contradiction, the positive dialectic of itself." In order to illustrate the way that contradiction is preserved, we need only investigate the way that contradiction is preserved in the concept of the ground. So I, I wanna give an example of, uh, I wanna work through from contradiction to ground and then articulate uh, the, the presence of contradiction in the concept of ground. Hegel's formulation of the PNC is that A cannot be A and not A at the same time. And this is a proposition for Hegel that expresses the category of identity. Note that in Hegel's formulation of the principle, what cannot be A and not A is not an, some different subject S, but A itself cannot be A and not A. What is precluded is that A stand in contradiction with itself. Identity is an absolute category that has absolute application like all the others. Each category is self-identical and is not its negation. Each category then is consistent. Each is not contradictory. Each category maintains its self-identity by precluding its negation. Identity and its formalization in the PNC requires the elevation, according to Hegel, of an absolute difference between A and not A. According to Hegel, quote, it is essential that we grasp absolute difference, absolute difference as simple, in the absolute difference of A and not A from each other, it is the simple not, which as such constitutes the difference, close quote. A is not not A. The not that separates A and not A is the absolute difference. Applied to identity and difference, identity is not difference and difference is not identity. Absolute difference as absolute, however, is not itself opposed to anything. Absolute difference is not one side of an opposition. It is the difference simpliciter, not difference opposed to some other. Absolute difference is not itself immediately opposed to identity. It is the difference between identity and difference. Accordingly, absolute difference is itself not different from anything. As absolute, it is not conditioned by another, not relative to another. To put it another way, absolute difference is the whole of the opposition. That is, it is an absolute difference. According to Hegel, Quote, difference in itself is the difference that refers itself to itself. It is the negativity of itself, the difference not from another, but of itself from itself. It is not itself, but its other, close quote. Since difference is absolute, it neither stands in any relation to another, nor is it opposed to anything other than itself. Hence, difference is not different from anything. For something to count as difference, however, and stand in a relation of difference, it must stand in a negative relation to something in virtue of which it is not that other. Absolute difference, however, does not stand in any relation of difference to anything, for it is absolute. Thus, absolute difference or difference as such is different from difference itself. Because difference is different from difference itself, it is that which is not identical to itself. Absolute difference, A, is not difference 
not A. Thus, A is not A. As a result, the difference between A and not A articulated in the PNC leads to contradiction and thereby violates the PNC. As Hegel comments here, quote, difference is implicitly contradiction, close quote. Difference turns back on itself, zishpitzian, and is self-negating. Difference is different from itself. Given that difference as such is not just different, but different from itself, Hegel says, quote, what is different from difference, however, is identity. And from this, it follows that difference is not just different from identity, but it is identity. Difference is identity. So to recount, what do we have? Difference is different from difference, and difference is identical to identity. However, what is more, because difference is different from itself, difference does stand in a relation of difference. Difference stands in a relation of difference with itself. Thus, difference is an instance of difference. Indeed, if difference is an absolute principle such that everything is different, then difference too must be different. Each term, A and not A, instantiates this difference, such that difference itself is the identical form of both. What is more, insofar as difference is different, difference is self-identical, for the predicate difference corresponds with the subject. Thus, difference as difference for Hegel differentiates itself into two terms, difference and identity. As a result, difference as such differentiates itself into these two terms and cannot be distinguished from the elements identity and difference, which are opposed to each other. Hegel writes that difference is the whole and its moment. Okay, so now we're on to contradiction here. Since absolute difference gives rise to both identity and difference as relative differences, and each admits the other, identity contains difference and difference contains identity. One is the positive, identity and difference in the form of identity, and the latter is negative, identity and difference in the form of difference. The negative is the specific other of the positive, the positive the specific other of the negative. Each is its other. The positive is the unity of identity and difference in the form of identity, while the negative is the unity of identity and difference in the form of difference. Since in the formulation of each, identity and difference are united, each is reducible to the formulation of the other. The positive is negative and the negative is positive. Accordingly, the positive is negative in virtue of itself, and the negative is positive in virtue of itself. What is the character of this contradiction? Like all the logical determinations, the unity of the positive and negative is absolute. It contains all the determinations. As Hegel writes about a contradiction, each moment is thus the whole self-contained opposition. Because the unity of the positive and negative is absolute, nothing is outside their totality. Accordingly, each stands by itself and depends only upon itself. Each, the positive and the negative, is self-subsistent. However, since both the positive and the negative are absolute, and yet each is distinct, each, according to Hegel, excludes the other in the same respect as it contains it, and so it is contradiction. In terms of enclosure, the positive is the absolute. It contains all the determinations. It achieves closure. However, the negative is and is outside the positive. Thus, the negative stands outside the absolute, the element of transcendence. Thus, the absolute is not absolute. Likewise, the negative is the totality of all the determinations, and yet the positive stands outside the negative. Thus, in the case of negative two, the same result is achieved. The absolute is not absolute. In the case of the positive and the negative, A is not A. Each absolute stands in contradiction with itself. Note, it would be enough if only one determination exceeded the absolute. However, the contradiction here is more than this. As we've already indicated, it is an absolute contradiction. Because each, the positive and the negative, is self-subsistent in the self-subsistent absolute, and each is distinct from the other, it is the absolute that transcends itself, the absolute as a whole that is not itself. As Hegel states, quoting, in its self-subsistence, the determination excludes its own self-subsistence from itself. For this reason, contradiction is the absolute contradiction of the negative and the positive. Quoting Hegel, this is the absolute contradiction of the positive, but it is immediately the absolute contradiction of the negative. The contradiction to use Hegel's formulation excludes itself from itself. 
sich selbst von sich selbst auszuschließen. Although being is nothing is a contradiction, we're only justified in identifying it as a contradiction or as a violation of the PNC after the PNC is established within logic itself, namely in the category of identity. Having arrived at the concept of contradiction, we can retrospectively recognize the violation of the PNC at the outset of the logic. Contradiction develops, however, into the category of the ground. It's not the end of the story. Contradiction is sublated. The opposition constituting contradiction, Hegel says, geht zur Grunde. It has gone back to its foundation, to its ground. The opposition geht zur Grunde. First, this means on the one hand that the ground arises in virtue of the collapsing of an opposition. Both the positive and the negative, it seem have the same content. Each is the absolute that is not absolute. Each is constituted by the very same contradiction. Thus, there is one category instantiated by both the positive and the negative, the self-contradiction of the absolute. As Hegel notes, die Selbstständige ist das Negative, gesetzt als Negatives, ein sich selbst widersprechendes. This uh, self-subsistent is the negative posited as negative, a, a, a self-contradictory being, a sich selbst widersprechendes something which contradicts itself. A that is A and not A. And further, according to Hegel, it is the unity of essence to be identical to itself through the negation, or well, here's the qualification, not of another, but of itself. So this identical to itself through the negation of itself. As a result, neither of the poles of opposition are self-subsistent. Rather, what is self-subsistent is the self-contradiction that each shares in common. It is only this self-contradiction that is without opposition. It is independent, all-encompassing, and without limit. Hegel notes how the positive and negative, which appear to be self-subsistent, are now mere determinations. He says, quote, it thereby reduces its formerly self-subsisting determinations, positive and negative, to determinations that are only determinations. It is simple essence, but essence as ground, close quote. What does that mean? Given that the opposition collapses or gate, why should this be sufficient for the development of the concept of ground? Note first that the ground is described in a similar way as contradiction, quoting Hegel. As ground, therefore, essence excludes itself from itself, close quote. Or to use other terminology, which is very similar, the ground is, quote, absolute repelling of itself within itself. That's the absolute Gegenstoss of itself. First, contradiction is conceived as a relation between two opposing terms, each which constitutes the totality, positive and negative. P is absolute, contradicts N is absolute. As a result, it is the case that both P is self-contradictory and N is self-contradictory. Nevertheless, because each opposed term is identical in content in the predicate, neither term is opposed to the other. Rather than two absolutes that stand in contradiction, there's one absolute instantiated in both cases. Each P and N is a particular instance of the same absolute. Note, however, that the content they share in common is that each is the self-contradictory absolute. Although the absolute is not in contradiction with anything beyond it, and I think that's important, it doesn't stand in contradiction with anything else because it's absolute, it is in contradiction with itself. That's the sich selbst widersprechens. It is a contradiction that is not relative to another, but only to itself. Self-contradiction is a unity instantiated in both terms. Each term is an instance of the same self-contradiction. The A that is not A. Hegel writes that in order to arrive at the concept of the ground, one must only, he says, add self-unity to the self-contradictory opposition. Quoting Hegel, the self-contradictory self-subsistent opposition was itself therefore already ground. All that was added to it was the determination of self-unity, close quote. Hegel employs a number of descriptions for the absolute self-contradiction, among which is self-exclusion. He also talks about being, things being outside themselves, self-alienation, self-externality. Because the absolute excludes itself, it is both not what it is, and it is something other than itself. The absolute P negates itself as P and posits itself as N. 
as M, E absolutely negates itself as N, posits itself as P. These determinations, P and N, to use Hegel's words, are selbstwidersprechenden Bestimmungen, self-contradictory determinations. One can equally conceive of the relation of ground to grounded in a circular as well as a linear fashion. The self-contradictory of P and N are perpetual. Although P negates itself and posits itself as N and N as P, one can count each new instance of the self-contradiction as a novel instance of self-contradiction without end. A is not A, it's other than A, it's B. B is not B, it's other than itself, it's C. And this uh, ad infinitum. A is a relative ground of B, B of C, and yet there is uh, an absolute ground of each, namely the self-contradiction that is perpetuating itself throughout the whole process. In each case of self-contradiction, there is something that remains the same. There's self-unity, and that is the self-contradiction itself. That's the self-unity. In virtue of negating itself, the absolute posits beings, P and N, beings that can only exist in virtue of the perpetual self-negation of that absolute. As a result, the concept of ground seems to involve the following. In virtue of the unified activity of self-contradiction, particular beings are positive. The perpetual self-contradiction of the absolute is the ground of what there is. Insofar as each being is grounded in the self-contradiction of the absolute, each being is that which is grounded. Thus out of contradiction, the category of the ground and the relation of ground to grounded arises. When ground is expressed as a principle, it has the form of the principle of sufficient reason. As Hegel formulates it, everything has a sufficient ground or reason, and Hegel thinks actually sufficient is redundant, actually. Because ground is inherently contradictory, Hegel is clear that the formulation of ground as a principle will contain antinomy. What he says in the Differenzschrift is that, quoting Hegel, the intellect has not grown into reason if it does not recognize the antinomy in the principle of sufficient reason, close quote. That is, there's an antinomy in the ground as such. Since Hume, philosophers have racked their brains on the problem of causality. And although here I'm not gonna talk about causality, we're only concerned with ground in the relation of ground to grounded. Hegel himself briefly addresses this problem of causality, both in mechanical and teleological senses in his remark on the principle of sufficient reason in the science of logic. So I just hear just uh, a few reflections that have some bearing and relevance on the question of causality. How can a necessary connection be established between ground and grounded? Of course, as Hume pointed out, this necessary connection cannot be established based upon experience, which can only give us contingent relation. And the relationship between uh, A and B is ultimately a result of uh, association, habit, and the like. As is obvious, Hegel's logic is a priori. He refuses to draw the connection between ground and grounded by appeal to experience. However, Hegel's answer to the problem does uh, more than simply render the connection a priori. The suggestion here is that A is necessarily connected to what is different from it, B, in virtue of self-contradiction. A is necessarily connected to what is distinct from it, B, only by overstepping its own limitation, only by negating itself. And Hegel will, this is, I think, clear from the fact that Hegel collapses the synthetic analytic distinction. He's clear about that in the absolute idea that the category is no less synthetic than analytic. A is synthetically connected to B in virtue of what is analytically contained within it, this power of self-contradiction. And this of course is, uh, fits well with Hegel's view that contradiction is the moving principle of the world and that contradiction is the root of movement and life. Putting that problem aside, however, with these reflections in hand on self-contradiction qua ground, we can better understand how the self-transformation of the absolute autonomously transforms itself from one logical category to another. Since self-contradiction is absolute, it applies to everything. Every category is an instance of self-contradiction. Because self-contradiction is also the ground of everything, self-contradiction is also the ground of every category. In virtue of its perpetual self-contradiction, the absolute posits itself as every category of the logic, being, essence, concept, truth, and absolute idea. The ground grounds the whole series of categories. Being A becomes nothing B in virtue of the self-contradiction of being. 
Finitude becomes infinitude in virtue of the self-contradiction of finitude. However, we must note that in the science of logic, the principle of explosion has no foothold. It's neither a presupposition as there are none, and every particular development of the logic leads to a specific category, such that particular categories follow from particular contradictions. To know that categories are self-contradictory is a formal truth. It does not specify what the self-contradictory categories are. To know what these categories are, one must uncover how each specific category contradicts itself and gives rise to its successor concept. And yet, if self-contradiction is the ground of the categories, does that not contradict the groundlessness of logic? Yes, it does. With the arrival of the ground, even the groundlessness of logic is overcome. Indeed, the logic can only acquire a principle for its very development by contradicting itself. And this is the idea that logic is uh, receding into its ground, and ultimately that means it's receding into the absolute idea, which is the method that grounds everything, the ground that comes at the end, the ground that is ultimately um, itself grounded. In the science of logic, Hegel continues to hold, to simplify the discourse here, that the category of contradiction is still present in the concept of the ground. In fact, the concept of the ground could not be articulated without the concept of contradiction. And Hegel just says that. Quoting Hegel, in ground, therefore, opposition and its contradiction are just as much removed as preserved. Der Gegensatz und sein Widerspruch ist daher im Grunde so sehr aufgehoben als erhalten. And what is more, this self-subsistence is the negative, he says, positive as negative, something self-contradictory, which consequently remains in the essence as in its ground, close quote. All right, I wanna come out of the dialectic a little bit, but, and talk about the form of truth more abstractly. The view that Hegel endorses true contradiction seems to violate Hegel's understanding of truth. Hegel writes that truth is self-correspondence or the agreement of the thought content with itself. Falsehood would be therefore the failure of self-correspondence. A is not A, however, is not the self-correspondence of the category with itself. To the contrary, the contradiction here and the self-contradiction is explicitly the absence of self-correspondence. Thus, one may infer that contradictions cannot be true because they do not correspond with the form of truth. Sorry, we just lost um, Alex. Let me let him in. Okay, sorry. Okay. So I want to talk about this objection. We have the form of truth, and it looks like contradictions just fail to live up to that. And that's an important objection to consider. Uh, before we address the critique directly or with, within dialectical thought, we first need to acknowledge that Hegel's discussion of truth per se is not so univocal. That's not surprising. For instance, in the Differenzschrift, Hegel states that, quote, once antinomy is acknowledged as the explicit formula of truth, reason has brought the formal essence of reflection under its control, close quote. And, quote, antinomy, that is, the contradiction that cancels itself, I would add, and preserves itself, is the highest formal expression of knowledge and truth, close quote. Here, contradiction is presented as the very form of truth itself, indeed its formula. This recognition of the contradictory form of truth is carried over into the science of logic too. In the science of logic, truth is the idea. Here, the correspondence of the concept with its object. The self-particularizing universal and the object that is the self-subsistent totality. Whatever we say about truth here needs to be preliminary, since what truth is requires more than categories such as consistency or inconsistency. We have to talk about concept, object, all this. The idea qua truth is the absolute truth, what it is to be true. And no category it seems is true unless it instantiates truth, the idea. The idea or truth itself in Hegel is first determined as life. So he says, quote, the immediate shape of the living being is the idea in its simple concept, the objectivity conforming to the concept, close quote. The term der absolute Widerspruch, the absolute contradiction, reappears beyond the doctrine of essence as a description of the category of life, the first form of truth or the idea. Hegel calls the self-determination of life the absolute contradiction. 
In life, the self-determination of the concept corresponds with the teleological character of the organism, wherein the purpose of the organism is the very means by which the purpose is realized. So the organism has this self-determining character that's built into its internal teleological structure. Indeed, if all contradictions are eventually canceled, would this not put an end to the concept of life itself? If all contradictions are canceled, so is life and the categories die. With the end of contradiction, so ends Hegel's campaign to reanimate the life of thought and to reanimate dead bones of logic. In short, uh, it's my view that Hegel never abandoned his early view that contradiction is the rule of truth. But if the form of truth is contradiction, if a category is not uh, contradictory, then it is not true. If all of Hegel's logical categories were merely consistent, none of them would be true, for they would fail to live up to the form of truth. So if we have all these passages before us, we find ourselves in a nuanced and arguably difficult position. The form of truth is, uh, contradiction is the form of truth, and truth is the correspondence of the concept with itself. As a result, we know that one, a category is true only if it corresponds with itself. But we also know that contradiction is the form of truth. Conceived together, these conditions seem to engender a dialectic concept of truth. If a category is true on the first criteria, then the category corresponds with itself. Because self-contradiction is a lack of self-correspondence, according to one or self-correspondence, no contradiction can ultimately be true. According to one, two must be false. It must be false that contradiction is the form of truth. Rather, contradiction should be the form of falsehood, not the form of truth. However, according to two, contradiction is the form of truth. Truth has the form of contradiction. And since contradiction is a lack of self-correspondence, self-correspondence must be false. Thus, if it, is two, if it is true that contradiction is the form of truth, then one is false. Namely, it's false that truth is self-correspondence. However, since both one and two are true, we know that whatever is true is also false. And whatever is false is also true. Together, one and two show that what is true is rather the consistency of contradiction itself or the self-correspondence of the contradiction with itself. I wanna talk about this briefly here. What is self-contradiction? Self-contradiction contradicts itself. If self-contradiction never contradicted itself, it would not be self-contradiction. But if self-contradiction were not self-contradiction, then it would contradict itself. Because self-contradiction must contradict itself, the predicate contradicts itself corresponds with the subject self-contradiction. Because there is a correspondence of subject with the predicate, the subject is consistent with the predicate. Self-contradiction is true. It is true to itself. However, what is self-contradictory is not consistent. Thus, the consistency of self-contradiction negates self-contradiction but self-contradiction is exactly that which negates itself. Thus the consistency of self-contradiction corresponds to what it is. Self-contradiction remains what it is even in that which is other to it. As Hegel notes, contradiction, Widerspruch, is as necessary as non-contradiction, close quote. Truth itself is consistent, it corresponds to itself. However, what corresponds to itself is the contradiction, which is the form of truth. Truth itself demands the unity of consistency and inconsistency. It certainly is the contradiction of consistency, but it is not only that, it is the consistency of contradiction. In Hegel's logic, consistency and self-identity are therefore not simply banished from the logic. They're not just discarded or overcome. Rather, they are canceled, but preserved in the consistency of self-contradiction. As Hegel notes, only, quoting Hegel, only once antinomy is acknowledged as the explicit form of truth, reason has brought the formal essence of reflection under its control. Does the self-correspondence of self-contradiction engender a complete absence of all contradiction? Decidedly not. In fact, because self-contradiction is consistent with itself, it is self-contradictory, it is consistently that which is self-contradictory. Because self-contradiction is self-contradictory, it corresponds with what it is, 
the predicate corresponds with the subject. Since self-correspondence is the meaning of truth, the self-contradiction of self-contradiction is the truth of contradiction. I think this subtlety uh, is, is easy uh, to miss when we think that the self-correspondence of speculative thought means that there are no true contradictions. The speculative result of a dialectical process is not the total elimination of contradiction. Uh, by my lights, speculative thinking stresses that the concept remains true to itself in its very self-contradiction. I briefly want to say something about this self-predicative character of uh, contradiction that I've been speaking to. Um, the truth of contradiction hinges upon self-predication, whereby the concept is predicated of itself. Self-contradiction is self-contradictory, predicates the subject of itself. Because Hegel is adamant that absolute categories are self-predicative, this structure is not only unique to contradiction, but can be uncovered in the very concept of conceptuality itself. The concept, der Begriff, is the concept, we'll call it C, in virtue of which every concept is a concept. The predicate of the judgment informs us about what the subject of the judgment is. The question, what is X, calls for an answer of the following type. X is such and such. Where such and such is the predicate that specifies what X is. The question, what is the concept, calls for an answer of the same type. The concept is such and such. Such and such is a concept that articulates what the subject is. Accordingly, the question, what is the concept, can only be answered by predicating conceptual of the concept itself, by predicating conceptual of C. Thus, whatever uh, answer to the question is proffered, it should have the following form. C is conceptual. C, the subject of the judgment, and C is conceptual, is the concept in virtue of which every concept belongs in the domain of concepts. Because C is just the universal concept, or what it is to be a concept, to predicate of C that it is conceptual is nothing less than to predicate C of itself. C is conceptual, according to Hegel, is a self-predicative judgment. Because C is the measure by which every concept is a concept, no concept can belong to the domain of concepts without having the predicate is a concept. If every concept is conceptual, the predicate of the judgment C, which is also a concept, must be conceptual too. According to Hegel, the self-predicative structure of concepts entails existential implication. This means that the concept is, quoting Hegel, this activity of dividing, of particularizing, and determining itself. So the concept is a self-particularizing uh, concept, self-particularizing. That's what I mean by existential implication. By predicating a concept of C and C is conceptual, C is placed in the subject position. It's conceived as a member of the domain of concepts. Because C is conceptual, C is an instance of C, a particular that instantiates C. In terms of ground, the concept is a sufficient ground for its own particularization. Although the concept is not reducible to the ground as self-particularizing, it is the sufficient ground of its own particularization. The self-predicative character of the concept is a further enrichment and development of the structure of self-transformation and self-contradiction elucidated earlier. The self-contradiction of self-contradiction instantiates the self-predicated structure of the concept and its self-particularizing power. The concept of self-contradiction particularizes itself and in virtue of that self-particularization generates a series of categories. Although Hegel will claim that the ground is self-determining, one can only justify the claim that the ground is self-particularizing only after the development of the concept. Because again, contradiction is supposed to be an absolute category, applies to all the categories. It's preserved in the concept too. The concept particularizes itself. So the concept for Hegel is not just universal, but it is also particular. As a particular, it is one instance of the concept alongside other particulars. So the concept is one particular concept alongside being, ground, contradiction, all the others. Because particular concepts exclude each other, they're not all inclusive. Qua particular, C excludes being and every other concept. Thus, as particulars, the concept is relative to others and is not absolute. However, the concept is absolute. Every category of the logic is a definition of the absolute. Thus, qua particular, the concept is both absolute and not absolute. In Hegel's language, the concept must be 
he says outside itself, which is an explicitly contradictory concept. He says, in this universality, the concept is outside itself. And because it is the concept, which is there outside itself, the abstract universal contains all the moments of the concept goes cool. I'll just say a couple of words about this. Since the concept is self-predicating and self-particularizing, and qua particular, C is not what it is or is outside itself, as particular, the concept is not self-predicating or existentially implicated. Because the concept is outside itself as particular, Hegel says the concept must be non-conceptual. So this non-conceptual dimension of the concept is the way that contradiction reappears in the logic of the concept. Since non-conceptual does not correspond with conceptual, as particular, the concept is not true to itself. It does not correspond to what it is. The abstract universal is one example of the concept that is not conceptual. There are other examples too for Hegel. It is a universal that does not particularize itself. This principle of identity and non-contradiction as understood as an abstraction, does not specify the particulars that instantiate A. The abstract universal is different in kind from the self-particularizing universal. One is self-particularizing, the other is not. Hegel writes that the abstract universal is, quote, indeed the concept, but the unconceptualized concept, the concept not posited as such, close quote. However, again, here's the qualification always and again. The unconceptualized concept sorry, <laughs> that which is other to the self-particularizing universal is one of its particularizations. Hegel builds the abstract universal into the very logic of the concept. And so the very counterexample to Hegel's dialectic system is built into the system itself. The counterexample is not only neutralized as an objection, but is transformed into the very soul of the concept by which the whole development proceeds. Without preserving the counterexample into the system, Hegel would lose the most powerful weapon by which the enemy of the dialectic is transformed into an advocate of the system. Right, so Hegel builds the counterexample into the very system itself so that when you appeal to the counterexample, you end up simply advocating what he's saying. That's essential to, I would say, this my own dialectic reading. here. All right, so to finish up, I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, contradiction, speculation, and the absolute. The absolute is all encompassing. It doesn't stand in contrast with anything. Because it stands alone, it cannot stand in contradiction with anything. One might raise the objection that speculative thought, which thinks the absolute, could not stand in contradiction. And that makes sense. There's nothing for it to stand in contradiction with. However, if the absolute stands in contradiction with itself, this objection dissolves. What is more, the text, I think, makes this reading difficult to sustain, or at least it makes it a debatable issue. Every category is a category of the absolute. The category truth is just as much an absolute category. Accordingly, the consistency of self-contradiction that is constitutive of truth itself, that it is both self-correspondence and contradiction, its consistency and inconsistency, should have an absolute significance. As a result, articulating what the absolute is inevitably invokes an appeal to contradiction. As Hegel states, speculative thought holds on to the contradiction, and Hegel's example of speculative thought indicates this. Hegel writes that, quote, speculative thought consists solely in holding on to the contradiction and thus to itself, close quote. Speculative thought does not let go of the contradiction. By holding on to it, it holds on to itself. Thus, speculative thought is inherently contradictory. In paragraph 79 of the uh, Encyclopedia Logic, Einteilung der Logik, Hegel divides the moments of the logic into three phases, understanding, dialectic, and speculation. Here, Hegel gives us an example of speculative thought that confirms this reading. However, because these remarks are only anticipatory and historical, on their own, they are not properly scientific and should be supplemented with illustrations from the logic itself. Hegel writes in paragraph 82, a one-sided proposition therefore can never even give expression to a speculative truth. If we say, for example, that the absolute is the unity of subjective and objective, we are undoubtedly in the right, but so far one-sided. 
as we enunciate the unity only and lay the accent upon it, forgetting that in reality, the subjective and objective are not really identical, but also distinct, close quote. So speculative thought thinks the absolute, and the absolute is the unity of the subject and the object. That is, the absolute is truth. It is the unity of the concept and the object. However, this is a relative concept of the absolute, for it only predicates one side of an opposition to the absolute. In order to articulate the speculative truth, one must also enunciate the difference between concept and its object, that is to say, the lack of correspondence between the two, namely falsehood. The absolute is also the difference between concept and object. The absolute is both the unity of concept and object and their lack of unity. It is true that the absolute is consistent. However, this is a one-sided or relative truth. It is also true that the absolute is contradictory. This is also true, but it is a one-sided or relative truth. Each proclamation excludes something true. In the former case, the absolute precludes the contradiction and is thereby not all-encompassing, not absolute. In the latter case, the absolute is relativized too, for it precludes consistency. Each articulation of the absolute is only a relativized one. According to Hegel, every judgment is one-sided on account of its form and to that extent false. The concept of the false as the one-sided motivates the dialectic concept of truth advocated here, for the falsehood of what is one-sided implies a commitment to the falsehood of consistency. By affirming one side of an opposition and negating its opposite, the absolute is a consistent finite being transcended by its other. However, such a consistent absolute is only a relative one-sided and therefore false one. However, what is the falsehood of the absolute? If truth is self-correspondence, the, con the consistent concept of the absolute should be true. However, when the true is taken to be true, it turns out to be false. For as non-contradictory as true, the absolute is not absolute. It's a relative absolute. It excludes the contradiction and therefore does not correspond with itself. The absolute is relative and therefore is false. The consistent concept of the absolute entails that the absolute is not absolute, which is a contradiction. We cannot affirm the consistency of the absolute without affirming the truth of contradiction. Since the consistent conception of the absolute renders it contradictory, the only way to cancel the contradiction engendered by the consistent concept of the absolute is to affirm that the absolute is inconsistent. The only way to cancel the contradiction is to preserve it. And indeed, the absolute cannot be thought consistently except as consistently contradictory. Thus, the absolute can only be truly absolute when it is contradictory. All that is required of the absolute dialethus is to read off the contradiction that is always already there in the very consistent thought about the absolute. Only thereby can ideality, the canceling and preserving of otherness and finitude be achieved. We will remember too that the absolute is false insofar as it does not correspond to itself. And when it is conceived as merely consistent, it is in contradiction with itself. This self-contradiction, the absolute is not absolute, is a lack of self-correspondence and thereby false. Thus, one will raise the objection that the absolute is false if it is only self-contradictory. This is true. However, when the false is recognized as false, this self-contradiction is consistently conceived, corresponds with itself, and is thereby true. The speculative concept of the absolute is not one-sided. It thinks the absolute absolutely. The absolute is only truly absolute if it is consistent and contradictory. Only once we recognize that the absolute is both consistent and contradictory do we have an absolute articulation of it. The absolute corresponds to itself. It is true when the absolute is thought absolutely in the contradiction and in the consistency of the contradiction. Because Hegel takes consistency to be an absolute truth, the consistent is itself already a unity of consistency and contradiction. Likewise, because the contradiction is also an absolute truth, the contradiction is itself a unity of consistency and contradiction. Note that although the consistent occupies both sides, so does contradiction. Where the absolute is, there the contradiction is too. The absolute maintains this character of the concept that is both the whole and the element of the whole. Hegel writes, each of the moments is just as much the whole as it is a determinate concept and a determination of the concept, close quote. Intriguingly, Hegel notes that the speculative is identical in meaning with what the philosophical tradition called the mystical or mysticism. 
I won't talk about this too much, I promise. A cursory reading of Pseudo-Dionysus shows that the mystical apprehends the absolute as something contradictory. Pseudo-Dionysus writes uh, that the absolute or God is the being beyond being, Hooper usia usia, that is to say the being beyond being. However, mysticism, according to Hegel, gave up on thought. It could not articulate the truth of that contradiction in a concept. Hegel's concept of speculative thinking corresponds to the mystical because it endorses the truth of contradiction. Unlike mysticism, however, Hegel's concept of the speculative integrates the truth of contradiction into logic itself. Because contradiction is integrated into a necessary logical development, Hegel can still critique romantic irony for its contingency and its arbitrariness while still holding on to truth of contradiction. In fact, we see the whole development from understanding through dialectics uh, to speculation arguably supports a dialectic reading. Hegel illustrates each kind of thinking by appealing to the development of the true infinite out of finitude. The understanding conceives of categories in their mutual exclusivity. Um, it proceeds by means of identity and non-contradiction. Understanding thinks the categories in their finitude. The absolute is finite. This is the truth of the understanding. Dialectic involves the self-cancellation of finitude, the internal self-negation of finitude, whereby finitude becomes non-finite. Hegel is explicit that the stage of dialectic is nothing other than the dialectic that's endless. The understanding affirms that everything is finite and dialectic cancels the finitude. Dialectic is a kind of thinking that overcomes understanding within itself. Dialectic is a negative fenuftige, negative, negative reason. The bad infinite, as we know, is an infinite opposed to finitude. The infinitude is bad in the sense that it is incomplete. There is something standing beyond the infinite. Because the infinite qua non finite is always in opposition to an other that it excludes, it is not truly infinite, but a false infinitude. So what is the affirmative or true infinity for Hegel? The affirmative infinite, what is grasped by positive reason or speculation, is the true one. Insofar as the infinite is not finite, and the infinite and finite stand in a relation of mutual exclusion. The infinite becomes limited and ceases to be infinite. Thus, in order for the infinite to be infinite, it must be finite. The infinite is finite. Because the infinite has no limit and whatever is finite has a limit, the infinite is unlimited and limited. It stands in contradiction. But naturally, the true infinite is not related to anything beyond itself. However, it is internally self-contradictory for the infinite is itself infinite and not infinite, finite. It's self-contradictory. A is A and not A. The infinite is infinite and not infinite. Speculative thought overcomes the relative or bad infinity, thinks it as the unity of opposition that constitutes absolute truth. That the finite is infinite is a contradiction. The infinite infinitely conceived, it's the truth of speculation that holds on to contradiction the contradiction that consistently contradicts itself without end, that is infinitely. Speculative thought is not other to the other stages, but constitutes the unity of understanding and dialectic. It cancels and preserves both finitude and the infinite within itself. An affirmative affinity in which the negative result of dialectic is also positive. So he says, um, the dialectic, it hat zu ihrem Resultat das Negative, the negative, but even as resultat to gleich as positive. So it has just as much the negative as the positive as its result. It's a unity of the negative and positive, that is to say, um, a contradiction. By preserving both understanding and dialectic, speculative thought preserves both the truth of finitude and its cancellation, it's false. By negating the negation of finitude, it preserves what has been canceled, and speculative thought raises the absolute to contradiction in which the finite is true and false. The result of this dialectic is the unity of negative and positive, which we'll remember is what constitutes contradiction. The dialectic of finitude leads to the true infinite, the infinitely self-preserving contradiction grasped by speculative thought. All right, so a final word, conclusion. If we read Hegel as endorsing a consistent view of the absolute that denies truth to contradiction, Hegel's absolute is relative. It fails to live up to the absolute. By reading Hegel in this way, by my lights, we fall victim to an old prejudice already articulated in Schlegel, that Hegel returns to the empty room of thought, of absolute thought again. 
or that the essence of spirit consists in the annihilation of an opposite, as he says. We find a similar charge played out in the critique of Hegel in the 20th century French philosophy. However, Hegel's, defeating Hegel is not so easy as Derrida points out in his critique of Levinas. As soon as Levinas speaks out against Hegel, Derrida says, he can only confirm Hegel, has confirmed him already. Dialethism, I would contend, rescues Hegel from such critiques leveled by the romantics and by postmodernists alike. What is more, Hegel is sometimes portrayed as an enemy of freedom. If all the contradictions die, freedom seems to die too. Once the contradiction dies and absolute universality reigns supreme, the universal can no longer determine itself. Self-determination, the very being of freedom, can only determine itself by imposing a determination upon itself. To render it self-determinate or make it self-determinate, it must negate its very indeterminacy and become other to itself. The indeterminate cannot remain indeterminate, but must become something determinate. Freedom seems to stand in a contradictory relation to itself. It must negate itself in order to reform itself. Without this perpetual truth of contradiction, freedom dies too. The bad pun that Hegel is a totalizer and a totalitarian thinker fails to grasp that Hegel, a true friend of freedom, conceives the absolute to be a free totality whose self-determination preserves the truth of contradiction rather than destroying it. So my apologies, I went a little long. Um, okay, thanks, Greg. Yeah. Um, so, uh, if you want to ask a question, please put your hand up. Um, okay, there are no hands appearing at the moment. Uh, I saw so, Anthony. Anthony had oh, a hand. Okay, what, actually what I meant was put your electronic hand up. <laughs> okay. Um, um, maybe you can tell people again how to do that. I, I don't know if everyone knows how to do it, I think. Um, all right. Um, at the bottom of the screen, uh, you will see an icon which says reactions, mm. okay? And one of those reactions is a raised hand. Mm. It's, it's just easier to see who wants to talk and what order they want to talk in. Uh, oh, sorry, that's my clapping hand. Sorry, that's not my... <laughs> yeah, okay, so not your clapping hand, your other hand. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, Anna, Michaela, uh, Paul, Oh no, Paul's got his thumb up. Well, we'll that out. Okay, Eleanor. Okay, shall I start? So yep. I, okay. Um, thank, thank you, Greg, for this very rich uh, um, paper. Um, I uh, am always thinking about uh, um, the way in which one could explain Hegel's logic uh, to contemporary philosophers, to contemporary analytical philosophers, and uh, to contemporary logicians. Yeah. Um, and um, so already uh, Adorno said uh, that uh, when you talk about Hegel's logic, nobody understands what, what it is. Um, uh, so and, uh, and Adorno was one of the people who, knew Hegel best perhaps in his times. Um, so, so my question is, uh, I, I, I found interesting, for example, what you said about the presuppositionlessness, okay. Well, <laughs> so that's the Versetzungslosigkeit okay. uh, no. of uh, Hegel's logic. And so you said, um, um, so you cannot assume, for example, that the love non contradiction is uh, valid. Uh, so if if we take Hegel seriously about uh, uh, the Voraussetzungslosigkeit of his logic, then we should say, okay, the love non contradiction cannot be assumed as a as a law. Uh, and um, at the same time, you stressed that. The contradiction can be interpreted as a as a law, as a rule, or as a, the form of Hegel's logic. So, how can you um, explain this this idea? Is uh, 
uh, then contradiction as form or contradiction as rule of Hegel's logic, a presupposition, if, if yes, if it is, how? Then uh, another question is, I think one should explain what is meant by contradiction, but I think you, it is impossible to explain it uh, pro probably because <laughs> I, as, as I can understand, even logicians uh, do not agree about the meaning of contradictions or find uh, uh, at least 30 different meanings of contradiction. So, so perhaps uh, it would be interesting to... Um, okay, so my, 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 my idea was while you were talking was uh, what is meant by contradiction, what... Uh, uh, is it a relationship, according to you, does, does Hegel think about contradiction as a relationship uh, among sentences or among propositions or concepts or terms? Uh, and, uh, and then uh, the, the meaning of truth. Uh, so you say uh, Hegel defines truth as the self-correspondence. Um, I don't know, perhaps it is uh, just a matter of translation into English. Because what I know about Hegel's definition of truth is just that he says, uh, well, the definition according to which uh, truth is correspondence of the, uh, so the nominal definition as Kant uh, takes it, uh, namely correspondence of the knowledge with the object, is of the greatest importance. So also according to Hegel, the, this definition is very, very basic, important, but it is, so his definition is not self-correspondence, self but perhaps, perhaps it is a matter of translation. And then also a matter of interpretation of, of what Hegel actually means by truth, because one could say, okay, there is, according to Hegel, there is no reality, uh, beyond the, the concept, and, uh, and so we could say uh, truth is just the correspondence of the concept with itself. But uh, I don't think that you you want to to have such an interpretation of Hegel. I think Hegel. So it would be. I, I don't agree with such an interpretation of Hegel, and I, I'm not sure that you would like to stress such a non-realistic interpretation of Hegel or a coherentistic in a way interpretation. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay, so Eleanor, Greg, um, there are 20 minutes left and there are already another three people in the queue. So can you make questions and answers brief, please? Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the questions. I'll try to be, those are really uh, good questions and um, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Okay, so no one understands Hegel, that's true. And probably no one will understand him in the future. So I take that as a given. Still, we-, we, we No, wait, no, no one understands Hegel's uh, science of logic. Oh yeah, 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 okay. Actually, I think science of logic is the clearest text. I think it's much clearer than phenomenology, which is like swallowing a brick. So let, let me just qualify that, okay? Um, but the first thing that I wanna say is, yeah, I think um, the science of logic, you could say begins without presupposition. In that way, it's, it's, one could say to be colorful, it's anarchical, it doesn't have a principle. But my view is that it develops a principle, namely that you begin with the groundless and you end up with the concept of ground. Namely, you end up with, again, if you go all the way to the end, the method, which is what grounds the whole thing. So you do, you do get a ground, uh, but the ground itself is something grounded by the logic itself. That's its self-determining character. So um, it's an anarchism that undermines itself and therefore posits a principle. So Hegel is justified to say that there's one, there's one principle of truth, which for him is the concept. Um, now, what is contradiction? The reason why I was being so text-based uh, text here is because some people would complain that calling Hegel a dialethist is a kind of anachronistic reading that is projecting ideas onto Hegel that isn't there, right? And what I want to try to say is that that isn't the case. And if you stay close to the text, you'll see that there are true contradictions there on Hegel's own terms. So this is why I also haven't um, uh, presented the discourse in terms that are more, I would say, friendly or endemic to say 21st century conversation. Uh, so that's, that's also uh, part of 
the rhetoric of the presentation. But I think contradiction involves, as I said, if, if you look at the formulation of the principle of non-contradiction there, it's that A cannot be A and, and not A. So what is, what is precluded is self-contradiction. And since in the logic, what we're dealing with are categories, contradiction is the, the self-contradiction of a category with itself. That, that's what's involved in, in contradiction. And as Hegel points out, what you have there is you have a unity of the positive and the negative. The positive is a unity of positive and negative. The negative is a unity of positive and negative. So strictly speaking, contradiction involves this, um, the positive being unified with the negative, the negative being unified with the positive, and yet each, the negative and the positive being different from each other. So um, as I tried to lay out, when Hegel talks about contradiction, he's not just talking about this or that contradiction, he's talking about the absolute contradiction, right? That's what the text says. Each, right, it's in the absolute category that is somehow in contradiction with itself. Um, and this is why I've, I've used the term absolute dialethism. I could just talk about, hey, absolute contradiction. I just want to add true to that, uh, that description. There's so much more to say, but I think the categories are being. So what is contradictory? A category is contradictory with itself. You can, it's also the case, I think, in Hegel that propositions are contradictory. You can formulate A is A, and then you can say A is not A, and you can put those together, right? So I think there's also a contradiction between propositions. And there's other senses too, but I, I, we're running short on time. And then finally- Okay, let's, okay. I, I, I think it'd be a good idea to push the discussion on because we've only got 15 minutes left at this point. Okay. Um, uh, Franca, your turn, please keep it short. Franca, if you're talking, you're muted. Franca, are you there? But the problem is that uh, I have a connection uh, which uh, is not so firm. Um, well, I, I want you to ask uh, many things, but uh, we don't have time. So I, I only wanted some, uh, just like uh, my daughter, uh, I have some lexical uh, problem concerning the vocabulary in a sense. Um, because, but I want to ask first, absolute. Uh, Hegel, as far as I know, thought that uh, uh, logic uh, is uh, the expression of absolute thought and absolute language thought, absolute logos, uh, which uh, uh, according to him coincide, coincides with being. First, can dialysis to share this point, this uh, view? First, second, can you share this view? And third, can we share this uh, absolute view about logic? And if yes, we, uh, we can, uh, what can we intend by, by absolute? Second, is it true that Hegel uh, confounds uh, difference uh, and negation because I have seen that you have uh, uh, particularly stressed uh, the difference from difference, uh, the difference from itself. Um, is it true this idea from Tendelenburg to Croce to Deleuze uh, that Hegel confounds uh, the two terms? Uh, so interpret uh, difference as negation, negation uh, with, as this difference uh, and so on. Third question, is self-contradiction the only absolute contradiction and the last, the last question, but you don't have to answer. Um, it, is, it is not important. We don't have time. Um, I will write you. Uh, okay. Um, is it true uh, for us, uh, like uh, it is true for Hegel, uh, that uh, the only uh, reality which is worth considering in philosophy is conceptual reality. 
That's okay, all. Thank, yeah, thank you very much. So let me say to the first question, yes, 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 and yes. So yes, all three. <laughs> okay, fine, good. <laughs> Second question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see confound difference in negation. Not at all, because negation is a completely separate category from difference. Difference requires yeah, negation. Sure, but Hegel confounds uh, yeah. sometimes. But I, I think no, negation, that's not is, true. negation is uh, necessary for difference. It's integrated into difference. Uh, but difference and negation, I think it would be a mistake to equivocate upon them. But you can appeal when, when you talk the about Trendelenburg, the Croce, and Deleuze were well, wrong. Frank, Franka, that, that's, there are other people in the queue. And yeah. then um, okay. number three, I would say there are there are many other contradictions besides the self contradiction of self contradiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, you can go category by category, like um, yeah, the self contradiction of self contradiction is a formal expression that then you can find articulated in the various contradictions in the logic, like being is nothing, uh, the, the infinite is finite, right? So I was just looking at one to illustrate how contradiction, even though it's sublated, is preserved in ground so that it's not canceled, but it, but it remains there. And then lastly, I would say that for Hegel, uh, I don't think there's anything beyond the concept. Actually, I, mean, I, view, I, I read him as a monist, which I know is not popular, but I actually think that but the object- Do you share of, this view? Yes, I, I do think- Do you agree with Hegel? Well, oh, do I? Uh, no, <laughs> no. I mean, I am- um, no. uh, yeah. I'm gonna push the conversation on at this stage. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, thank Stefan. you. I thank you for thank your you. answers. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your talk. Um, so my question is, you said that each concept or each category is an instance of the absolute. So in a way, it seems like you're thinking that each category or thought determination in the logic is as an instantiation of the absolute at the same level. Like we have being, we have nothingness, we have Dasein, we have becoming, we have blah, 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 up until the um, absolute idea. Um, and each is like just there and identical with itself and at the same time contradictory to itself. So one, uh, one thing is it runs against a lot of interpretations of Hegel who would say like Toynesen or Wolfgang Wieland or whoever, that the beginning of logic is an illusion or is in a way deficient and um, it's not a good definition of the absolute and there is like a climax um, up to the end and the last idea is the best definition of the absolute or the only definition of the absolute, um, which I wouldn't agree, but would be an argument against you. But um, in your definition of truth, you left out the definition that um, the truth is, is the whole. So it seems to be the whole process of logic, which is truth and not each idea in itself. And you seem to run in some sort of kind of Platonism like in Sophie's taste that um, we have these um, determinations of logic and they are like the ideas in themselves. And then like the um, simple okay, um, of the ideas, they are just connected to each other. But it doesn't seem to me like this, that um, Hegel really thinks that we have these um, determinations and then they are also related to each other, but they are a result of a process. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks for your question. So to be brief, I think that the, um, you're exactly right that the true is the whole. And actually um, that's something that I've tried to emphasize in emphasizing that even the category of truth is an absolute category. So when we talk about truth, we're talking about the whole. So what I've said is, is in no way out of sync with, with, with the view that truth is the whole. And actually, the whole idea that self-contradiction is the ground that posits particular categories. Being contradicts itself, produces nothing. The finitude contradicts itself, produces the infinite. It's not like you have all these uh, separate categories that then someone is connecting, but rather you have a self-transforming process that can be described as self-contradiction, right? Mm -hmm. So um, my reading is platonic in another way though. The way that it's platonic is that what you have in the logic are atemporal categories that are involved in a process of self-transformation. 
I mean, if you can find time in the logic, I would be very interested to find where that is. Rather, what you have are categories that are atemporal and at the same time are undergoing a process of transformation. I think that's why Jens Halfassen was exactly right to locate the point of connection between Neoplatonism and Hegel. Because if you look at the Neoplatonists, what do they have? They have one intellect and soul, right? And what is the intellect? It's thought thinking itself, right? It's, it's, it's not yet nature, it's in motion, right? And yet it's staying the same as itself. The Neoplatonists also have this idea of uh, thought thinking itself that's atemporal, that's involved in self-transformation. So uh, there are platonic links. I think my reading does stress that side of things. I don't wanna deny that, but I don't think that comes at the cost of development uh, in any way. Um, yeah, I think I could probably say more, but I'll, I'll just leave that for now, but there's, there's more to say about it. But th thanks for the question. Yeah. Okay, thanks Greg. Um, look, unfortunately I have another meeting to go to at 10. So Eleanor, can I ask you to take over the chairing? We can go maybe five or 10 minutes over since we had the introductions, if that's okay with with me. Yeah, uh, that, that's fine by me. I just have to go for another meeting. Um, look, uh, Eleanor, there, there's a question from uh, Paul in, in the chat box, which I just noticed. So I think probably we should let him go next because uh, his, the time zone he's in. Um, then there's Anthony and then there's Michaela. Okay, so those are the three people in the queue that I have at the moment. Okay, so uh, Paul. Right, thanks, Brian. Um, I couldn't find the electronic hand. Um, my, my, I'm uh, the Platonism thing uh, was what, um, as we got got my attention, um, but specifically the atemporality uh, aspect of it, and that I don't see really how that sits with another dimension that you were stressing later on. Um, concerning the concept of self-particularizing. Okay. Goodbye, Graham. Thanks a lot. You can, can you hear me? Yes, 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 I can. Right. Thank you. The concept of self-particularizing. Now, I take it that, I mean, your use of particular there is the sort of English use, which is not Hegel's use, right? I mean, the English use blurs Hegel's distinction between Einzel and Besonder, you know, singular and particular. And I take the, the sort of Hegelian sense of self-particularizing as mm -hmm. the sort of thing, you know, that he likes in Christianity, that God becomes someone, <laughs> right? But the concept becomes something. And that someone was in time. I and mean, we can't deny that. The concept becomes temporal in Hegel. Um, that doesn't seem to be to be in, temp, in tension with Platonism, actually. Uh, and I think you're right that Hegel's Platonism is heavily refracted through sort of Neo-Platonism, but I don't think that makes him committed to um, absolute uh, atemporality in logic, as you were suggesting. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much for your question. I'm glad you asked it. Because I've restricted the, my talk to the logic per se, I didn't address um, the relation of concept to time, right? So much. But I think that the, um, I don't deny that the concept becomes temporal um, or, or that the concept isn't uh, temporal at all. I mean, I think that's what happens with nature. So when logic completes itself and then becomes external to itself as nature, you have space and time. So I think that space and time, uh, their very existence is contingent upon a self-transformation at the level of logic that is not temporal. And I would say then that, yes, there is this whole development in nature, the development of, organi uh, of the inorganic and then the organic, and then the, the minded organic, and then the, the minded organic that knows itself, and then that engages in philosophy. And all of that's going on. But I don't think that all of that, um, I think that that's all posterior in a certain way. But singularity is singularity is a logical, mm, yeah, is a logical yeah. determination. It's yeah. not doesn't. I mean, let's talk about singularity, right? So singularity, yeah. uh, Einzelheit, right? So we have Allgemeinheit, Besonderheit, Einzelheit. Yeah? yeah, universality is Allgemeinheit, and the concept as such is an Allgemeinheit, and it becomes particular, right? So the concept is not only what all concepts have in common, but it's also one particular concept. It's a Besonderheit, right? 
So if you have the domain of concepts, you'll see quality, quantity, and you'll also see the concept as one particular concept, as a besonderheit. But then you're right, I didn't talk about singularity, it's a lot to talk about in one talk, but you're exactly right. The unity of universality and particularity is Einzelheit. It's the unity of Allgemeinheit and Besonderheit. The concept is both universal and particular. And that is at least, um, I think that unity is constitutive of what Einzelheit is supposed to be. But Einzelheit doesn't require any reference to anything temporal. Einzelheit is a category of the logic coming out of Besonderheit and Allgemeinheit. And it's not clear to me how, what justification one would have for introducing time into that discussion. There are singularities that are temporal, but I don't think every singularity is temporal. So I would agree that there are singular temporalities, but not that every singularity Would, would is. you think that would, would concrete be a category, though, an adjective that you would associate with singularity? Yeah, yeah, I think the singular concept is the concrete universal. But I think the concrete, uh, you can have a concrete universal that isn't temporal. I mean, okay, okay, well, we'll yeah, I mean, but this, this is another. We, this is, we have to disagree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's good. Thanks. Good. Anthony? Thanks for your talk. Um, so Hegel defines to sublate as to preserve and to cause to cease. And you were emphasizing contradictions being preserved in uh, an act of sublation. So I wonder if you could say a bit about how it is that um, being an act of sublation in that act, a contradiction would be caused to cease. Yeah, so actually this becomes, um, once you emphasize the side, the side of preservation, then the question comes up, well, what's the, how is it canceled at all? Is there any canceling going on at all? So that, that might be the, the worry. Rather than uh, preservation being the worry, now one might worry, is it ever canceled, right? <clears throat> and there's a sense in which it is canceled. And I think one sense in which it's canceled is that it is one of the categories among others. There are categories that come after it. Uh, it's not sufficient for the full articulation as it turns out of the absolute. So the absolute turns out to cancel contradiction in that sense. Contradiction is one category, right? Among others, it's a relative uh, to the others, right? It's one determination excluding others and it's one determination of the logic as a whole, right? On the other hand, it is also um, a definition of the absolute. So on the other hand, it's also the case that it has application to all the categories. And in that way, I'm saying that it's preserved. So it has this, um, and I think you can see this at the level of um, that the absolute has to both be absolute and it has to be relative, all right? So whatever the absolute is going to be, right? It's going to be absolute, all encompassing, but it's also going to be one of those and not the others. And so contradiction is like all the others, I would say, um, that it's, it has absolute application. It applies to all of them, but it's also, here's the canceling part, just one of many, uh, right? So I, you know, one could give a whole talk on the absolute as substance. <laughs> and then one could talk about everything being substance and also how this is just uh, one determination of the absolute, right? So it's the idea of the absolute as the whole and the moment of the whole. Uh, and so the contradiction as canceled is arguably something like the moment of the whole, but it's also preserved as canceled. This is, I think, where things get kind of meta-dialectical. There's a canceling, and then there's a preserving of the, of, of the, con of the concept as canceled. And so I think things are really tricky, you know? I think it's, it's a very tricky, but it's a great, a great question. Uh, Michaela. Thanks, Greg, for the talk. Um... Um, my question is simple, and uh, uh, when uh, I was uh, listening to your talk, I was thinking about uh, Angelica Nuzzo's paper, Is it true to wear a coin, where she criticizes the, the, the effort to attribute to Hegel a notion of truth, uh, uh, where you work with uh, uh, two, uh, truth value, truth and falsity. And, and I was... Uh, Wondering if talking about uh, the category as uh, concealed and preserved, 
mm. and therefore as a truth uh, uh, and false. Mm. Mm. Does not run the risk to prevent us from uh, understanding the developmental character of truth in Hegel's logic? I think the question is related to what uh, uh, Anthony uh, was asking. As you, as you know, my problem is with <laughs> how we use the category of a falsity. Uh, and, uh, but I'm curious to know uh, what you think about this developmental character of the truth in the logic and uh, how you deal uh, with it by using truth and force with respect to its criteria. Yeah, 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 thanks. So um, I was especially sensitive to using <clears throat> the term falsehood in a careful way after our last conversation uh, about my own book. And, um, you know, it occurred to me that falsehood is said in many ways or is arguably conceived in, in many ways in Hegel. Again, one, and it, it, it's, it's always in relation to a definition of, of what truth is, uh, right? So on the one hand, it looks like, and I think this citation, you, you can find it in the encyclopedia logic, this um, self, correspondence, the concept with itself. And again, as Elena pointed out, that's engendered by the fact that the concept is self-objectifying. And so when you look in the object, you're really not finding anything other than the concept anyway. Um, so you can look at falsehood as a lack of self-correspondence. Um, you can also look at the falsehood as an absence of contradiction because contradiction is the form of truth. Hegel says that. Right. And so um, that's a shorthand way of kind of getting to the view that Hegel is a dialethist. That if you have both of those, if you articulate truth in both of those ways, you're inevitably going to find yourself in contradiction when you try to articulate what the truth of a category is. But I, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, that's not particularly helpful to illustrate the way that the, the categories themselves develop. Um, right. But I think that's, um, it's not inconsistent, or I should be, be very careful. Right? It's actually not, um, it doesn't undermine, I don't think, the, uh, a, this idea that logic is self-developing. That, um, I guess my question would be, uh, in, in what way or why would it undermine the idea that logic is a self-developing, self-transforming, self-particularizing totality. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> and, uh, I don't, I just want to maybe throw it back. I, I just don't see how it would, You know what, you, you know, know what, is that saying that it, I, I agree with your reading basically because uh, uh, when we were discussing last time about the notion of falsity, uh, really it's a concept, a, a content which does not correspond to itself. But the fact is that saying that it is false, it seems to say that it does not correspond to itself at all. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But exactly. actually, but I think that, for example, when we have the finite, for example, the first moment of the finite, the finite in its immediacy, what does Ego says? He says simply the finite uh, um, passes over into its non being. That's the immediacy of the finite. And this is richtig, this is correct, but it is not true. Saying that this is false, maybe for me it's too much. <laughs> or uh, and uh, beyond this, saying that uh, um, the finite is concealed and preserved, hmm? uh, it uh, or that is uh, that it is true and false. It's um, for me it runs the risk to 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 transform the movement of the. Uh, the uh, dialectic of the finite uh, into two states of affair, the finite correspondent does not correspond to itself, you know? Uh, so I think it's correct what you say, that's really. <laughs> I'm not completely sure, I'm not completely convinced yeah. that it is bad, that it is true. Uh, if I'm thinking about Hegel logic, but yeah. I I'm, don't wanna say that dialectism is inconsistent with Hegel logic, my, uh, the, the only the reason why I never published my book is I'm not totally convinced that mm -hmm. dialectism tell the, tells, can tell the whole story about the Hegel logic. But we already discussed yeah, yeah. about that. I mean, I don't think it tells the whole story. It's just one part of the story. 
It's just the, the reason why I emphasize it is that people are very adamant to deny it, to deny that there are true contradictions. Maybe there's a difference between saying there are true contradictions and Hegel's a dialectist. And that's an interesting question, right? So I would, I mean, and I think like in your own work, Michaela, you've pointed out there are true contradictions, but you also say he's not a dialectist. So I'm interested to see, you know, uh, as we keep discussing, right? Uh, what are some of the nuances that come up when we ask this question? You know, is it the same thing to ask, are there true contradictions in Hegel? And to ask, is he a dialectist? Right? Can you have a true contradiction and have no falsehood? Right? So those are the kind of questions I'm really interested to explore and to think about as we go on uh, here. And yeah, and the only reason I, I focus on the dialethism point is again, nobody thinks it's really a controversial thing to think being is carried along throughout. Of course, everything is. And yet contradiction somehow doesn't make it. So it's a little, it's, it seems to me a bit, a bit convenient. That would be uh, a polite way of putting it. Contradiction doesn't make it, but being somehow does. I mean, it's uh, what's so special about a contradiction that it doesn't make it? Or uh, it, why is it not last thing? Yeah. Okay, yes, Michaela, uh, last thing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that is uh, related to what Elena has asked at the beginning. Uh, because you, you asked, uh, can we have a contradiction without having falsity? And my answer would be depends on what definition of contradiction you use. Exactly. If you are using a semantic notion of contradiction, uh, it's impossible to have a contradiction without having falsity. But you, we know that we have also other definition of contradiction, ontological, syntactic, pragmatical, and so on. But I stopped here and thank you so much. I'm, I'm looking forward for our it. next discussion. <laughs> Yes, yes, this last uh, point uh, is uh, absolutely crucial. And I think it is going to be the, the one of the main point of our discussion I think so. uh, during the, yeah, the next the presentations. Thank you so much, uh, Greg, for your talk. Thank you, um, uh, Michela, Stefan, Franca, for, uh, and uh, Paul and Graham and Anthony. To, for, for the participation and uh, I look forward to seeing you next week on Monday. Yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks everyone for sticking around, asking your great, great questions. Sorry, we kind of were short on time. Next week, we shouldn't be so short, so. Yeah, my talk is going to be very short next oh, okay. week. Okay, <laughs> we'll have a lot of time to ask you questions next time. Okay. Bye. Right, thanks everybody. Bye guys. Bye. See you Bye. next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Greg. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs>